Hey, what's up there, YouTube? Um, so I'm going to do something a little different. And keep in mind, I'm just trying to figure this whole YouTube thing out. I'm trying to answer everyone. And, you know, I talk about my truck. I talk about life. I talk about my dog. You know, I, I do music. I, I, I'm all over the place. I know. I'm sorry. But I don't want to have one of those channels where it's only one thing. Uh, I just want to be natural, right? I just want to go with the flow. If I want to take a video of it and put it on the internet, great. You want to watch it? Awesome. You don't? Okay. I'm sure I'll have something for you. Anyway, so here's a list. I, I compiled a list of like 20 questions um, that I've gotten in an email, which I have about 100 and something emails, and I just checked all my emails at 8 a.m., and now it's about 4. Ah, oh, Fridays. Fridays in construction. All right. So I want to go through these questions. I want to answer them the best I can. So if you're looking to get into the industry uh, or you need help or you have a question about ongoing operations in the commercial and industrial sector, mission critical. Uh, as for residential, uh, that's not really my forte. That's not really what I do. I can answer a lot of questions you know, regarding legalities and things like that when it comes to residential, but, you know, attempting to get work and things like that, residential, I have no desire to get into that, nor do I have any insight on it because I, it's just a different animal. It's too saturated of a market. Um, that's why when I speak to people, I talk to people, I, I, I make sure everybody knows that I am not a residential guy. I don't ever suggest to anyone to, who's getting into construction and getting into residential. Um, it, I just think that the market's sat, saturated and you have to deal with a lot of people that are unlicensed or uninsured. And, you know, if you if you keep your price points high, you don't have to deal with that. Okay, let's start with the first question. Okay, what are the legal requirements and permits needed to start a construction company in this region? Okay. So to whoever wrote that question, which I, I should have put everybody's names, but uh, I didn't, uh, and their locations. So, okay, so what are the legal requirements? Now, if you're in the United States, and, you know, once again, we're talking about commercial industrial, then you would need uh, to be incorporated in some way, shape, or form, right? Whether it's a, a C-Corp, an S-Corp, LLC, limited liability, whatever it is, um, you have, you have to have some sort of a, a corporation, have yourself an EIN. Now, are there people that can do sole proprietorship and things like that? Yeah, okay, but um, you're not going to make it in the commercial and industrial sector because, it, you know, it just it doesn't work. I, I've never seen any um, sole proprietors do any work in a data center, let's say, or, uh, you know, a Tesla uh, plant. It's, or Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley, whatever. It's really not going to see that. So I would imagine that, yes, you do need a corporation. You need an EIN. Uh, I would say, you know, you need a Duns and Bradstreet. You know, you got to get your ni uh, nicest codes. Easy stuff to do. Um, requirements depend on, and I'm assuming that they, when they say permits, they're talking about licensing. Now, that depends on what you do, right? In some states, to be a general contractor, you do not need a license. Um, and in some states, you don't need a general contractor's license until you hit 25000 of a job. But then there are some states that do require you to get a license if you are a general contractor. Now, if you're a skilled trade, typically, and I haven't seen any states, or I don't know of any states that you do not need a license to practice your craft, if you will. I'm personally an electrical contractor. I'm an electrician by trade. I'm a licensed electrician. Um, so, you know, I would assume that you need to pick what you're going to do, whether you're going to be a plumber, an architect, a, a general contractor, a painter. You know, obviously there's going to be some trades that there's no license whatsoever. Uh, you know, like painting. I, you know, you don't really come across... Uh, too many companies that had to have a license to be a painter, but then again, I don't know, I'm not a painter. So I would just suggest that wherever you are, um, you reach out to the AHJ, meaning the 
uh, authority having jurisdiction, you should know what AHJ is. So that would be, you know, the building department, whoever issues the permits, you could call them up and you could tell them, hey, I'm looking to do X, Y, and Z. Now, if you're outside of New York City, people will actually pick up the phone and help you. Uh, you know, or if you're in California, same concept, you probably have to really hound them or wait online or I don't know. New York City is very difficult to get anyone on the telephone. So let's assume that you have your, your corporation and things like that and you get your license. Now obviously there's a lot more to it than that. Just your naming, the naming of the business is very time consuming, difficult if you will. Um, what I like to do is when I started, like let's say Just Electric TX, uh, or let's use NYC, because Just Electric NYC came before Just Electric TX. Just Electric NYC, my name is Justin, I do electric. And I don't do painting, I don't do plumbing, I don't do HVAC, it's Just Electric, right? Now, Just Electric is unfortunately a common name, but to differentiate myself from everybody else is I was in New York City and all the other corporations that were listed in New York that, was called, that were called Just Electric, they weren't in New York City, so I made sure that my company name, my corporation name was Just Electric NYC. <coughs> Once I figured that out, <coughs> that that's the name I was going to go with, I didn't incorporate yet. I went and I, I looked to see if the name was available, it was available. I went to GoDaddy to purchase the domain. So I wanted the website to say justelectricnyc.com. Once I knew I was able to get that, that domain, I bought it and I submitted my paperwork to do a corporation. And then once you submit your paperwork for a corporation and your EIN, then you submit your S Corp form. And then once you have all that, then you could submit it with your license to the AHJ to make sure you become the licensed contract. Your company is now the license holder. Um, so we could go on and on and on about the beginning stages and what you need to do on that question and if you guys want to do that we could I could do a separate video but let's go on to the next one the, well the next question kind of falls into that how do I obtain the necessary licenses and certificates certifications to operate a construction business once again you're gonna call your your AHJ and figure out what you need certification wise licenses and certifications are different so I can be certified to do a lot of things. It doesn't mean I'm licensed to do that, right? Like let's say I have an EPA Universal. It's a real license. It's called the EPA Universal, um, which allows me to capture and recycle uh, refrigerant for HVAC systems, chillers, uh, even cars, right? Which comes in handy, right? And uh, you could also go to the store and you could buy gases. So you could buy refrigerant. Uh, you could buy acetylene, you could buy, you know, gas from a, a store where you would need a license to do so or a certification. That's certification. Just because I have that certification doesn't mean I can start doing work. Now I moved to Texas. Um, you can't just do HVAC work. You have to have a license. So even though I have that EPA Universal and I know what I'm doing, as far as the state goes, I do not. So I need to meet that criteria for licensing. So you just have to figure out the licensing and the easiest way to do that is to call, call the people up and say, hey, I'm looking to do this, what do I need? Um, and don't, don't get discouraged if you don't qualify, right? Because, um, all right, it's not hypothetical, this really happened, is um, I came from New York City and, and we don't have the same ways of tracking time uh, in being an electrician. So coming down here, uh, even though I have my my hours and schooling or whatever, uh, they would the Texas would not allow me to take the master electrical license. They wanted me to take the journeyman's test first, hold that card for two years, work on the Texas license holder, and then retest or test for the master electrician or electrical contractor down here, which is fine. It was a back and forth thing. It went on over a year going back and forth with Texas and emails and social security printouts and letters. 
it was a nightmare, but it is what it is. And I kind of appreciate that, right? Because it doesn't allow people to saturate the market, right? Because a lot of people are moving to Texas. Uh, it could be a lot of New York City guys that maybe they're mass electricians as well, and they want to come down here and they open up electrical contractors, and now we have a whole bunch more electrical contractors. So it kind of works out, you know. I, I would like it to be better, but... So what I'm getting at is that even if you don't hold the license, you could hire a license holder. When you hire a license holder, whatever trade it is, even if you're not qualified to be a licensed contractor, your company is the license, right? The, you have a sign, you have a rep, a signed rep. So if I want to say it's just plumbing Texas, I'm not a plumber, but I could hire a plumber that's licensed, then I bring him in under my payroll and now he's the license holder for the company. And then you could always work out a deal, whether it's going to be a minimum wage and a percentage or whatever, you know, that's a different story altogether. Okay, what did a typical startup cost involved in opening up a construction company? Now, assuming that you could, that you don't need the license or assuming that you do need the license, whatever that fee is, set aside 1500 bucks for that. Okay, because there's going to be other qualifications that they want you to meet, uh, especially when it comes to insurances or site safety, LLIPs, things like that. Starting a company is pretty easy. I mean, so let's say you found your name, you bought a domain, right? You could use Name Hero, GoDaddy, whatever. You, you buy the domain, right? Let's say you buy it for two years or whatever. It's $10 or $12 and you put together a quick website and if you're going to do that I would suggest GoDaddy it's a little bit easier it's plug and play um, so you get a few emails you figure 350 let's call it 350 for the corporation filing right you could say 500 if you want to budget 500 for it that's fine the more the merrier right then you'll only be happy when it's less the EIN is free don't ever pay anybody to get an EIN you just go on IRS's website, you type it in. There's actually links on my website, plansandbids.com. gives you all that information. It's free. So don't, don't pay anybody for this stuff. Don't use these websites that, that streamline or whatever. They don't streamline anything. Just register the business yourself. Then you get yourself an EIN with the name that you already bought the domain. Get your insurances, whatever they require. Uh, all in all, I you know, if I had to just throw a, a blanket number on it, twenty five hundred bucks, okay, twenty five hundred bucks. That's with putting down money on your premiums for insurance. If you want to remove that from the equation, then I don't know, say thousand dollars or less, and you're you're in the races, right? Um, and now we're not talking about computers or anything like that because then, you know it starts getting really pricey. Okay, what insurance coverages, coverage is necessary for a construction company and how can I obtain it? Okay, a uh, simple rule of thumb is that most places, especially Manhattan, are going to require you to have a $2 million uh, general liability policy, a $2 million aggregate, and a $5 million umbrella. So it's a 225. So when you're in the insurance game, you understand that, you know, a one, two, five, or a two, two, five, or when I had Just Electric NYC, I ended up having a five, five, 30, which was a big policy. Um, so general liability, your aggregate, and your umbrella. You need umbrella. You need all these insurances, right? Um, New York City, required me to have a commercial truck van so you have to then get an, a commercial auto policy which is a little bit pricier um, so if you figure you, get, you put the money down there so you have your auto and you got to figure that's a one million dollar policy uh, that's in case you you drive your truck uh, on a job site and you crash into something or you knock down a supporting wall or whatever, um, then your insurance will catch. But then you also have general liability, arrogant, and umbrella, so you're covered. 
right? And that's all, that's all it's about, is everybody wants to make sure you're covered. Other insurances that you're going to need is your workman's comp. Um, now, it depends on the size of your business and the state and city, but if you do need it, you figure it's a $250,000 policy. Um, sometimes you can go right into a assigned risk pool or sometimes you go into a pay-as-you-go. If you get into a pay-as-you-go plan, like let's say with ADP or Paychex, that's going to be your best bet because that means you're not going to have to come up with that, that huge number every month for workman's comp if you use it or not. Um, so if you can do a pay-as-you-go, that's your best bet. So you got your auto, GL, arrogate, uh, umbrella, disability, workman's comp. I can't think of anything else on the, off the top of my head at the moment for insurances. But that's a good start. That's a lot of money. Right? How do you obtain it? Well, you call up different companies. You never go with just one, right? Just like when, when we bid projects, we don't bid one time. We bid three times. And... Um, the people I've had the best luck with in terms of pricing was a company called Gaslamp. They're based out of California, but they write policies for New York, uh, which is uh, an issue, right? Because a lot of people don't write policies for New York City. There's a lot of issues that happen in New York City. A lot of insurance claims. So, Gaslamp seemed to be the cheapest I found. When I get to Texas, I gotta make some coffee. When I came to Texas, I ended up switching over to a company called Goosehead. When they told me the name, I was like laughing. Goosehead, that's the name? But yeah, they were pretty good. Uh, I had a one, it was a one one two. So one million general liability, arrogant, and then two million dollar umbrella. Wasn't a big policy because out here is a different story, right? You're not dealing with high rises, you're not dealing with multiple tenants and things like that you know back home in New York City I was doing high-rises and commercial stores and retail stores and things like that uh, or data centers so you know if you swing an elbow too hard in a data center that could cost you ten million dollars so something to consider even cell sites if you take down a cell site they could charge you upwards of a million dollars a minute it's, you know it's it's serious stuff so um, okay, next question. How can I secure funding or financing? <sighs> How can I secure funding or financing for my construction business? This is a tricky one because <clears throat> you need to fund it yourself. Once you put your hand out, you got partners, right? And on top of that, nothing is written in stone here. Nothing is guaranteed. You could open up the nicest office and have the best workers and you might not land one job. So I would just, I would stay, I would say stay away from borrowing money or funding it with someone else's money. If you're serious about it and you, you believe in yourself, then you fund it. And realistically, you shouldn't really need too much money to get this whole thing going. And your first project that you land, you need to charge a 35% mobilization. And that 35% mobilization is going to float you and then it should float the projects now in terms of materials if you're a general contractor then hey um, if you could sub everything out then let your subs deal with it if you're an electrician and you have to get material like I did <sighs> you have credit lines I had credit lines with Graybar, Terrell and & Hughes and various other companies so you, you buy your material on credit um, and then you have to do a personal guarantee, meaning it doesn't matter what happens with the company, you know, if your client doesn't pay, you still owe what you owe, right? It doesn't matter. You could bankrupt the company, you still owe it. You have a personal guarantee. So I don't think that you really need to concern yourself with the funding or financing. Uh, I wouldn't even, and, and it's going to be very difficult, so don't even bother. Uh, just don't. Just try to do it all yourself. I'm telling you the best way to go about this stuff ain't. It's not going to cost you a lot of money either. So, Okay. What types of construction projects are in demand in this area? Okay. I don't know what area that is. Because um, I didn't write down the name or the area. <laughs> but um, I can tell you Texas is data centers, uh, car manufacturers, 
and chain stores, retail stores, box stores, right? That seems to be what's in demand here. And there's not too many contractors that, that know mission critical. Mission critical is going to be your data centers, your, your control rooms, uh, military installations, you know, even cell sites I would consider mission critical because you can't knock down uh, the 911 system, the E911 system. So that would be mission critical. Um, so it depends on your area, right? Uh, New York City is still going to be residential, high rises, mixed use build, buildings, retail, always in demand. Jersey is a lot of data centers, um, Virginia data centers, you know. So it just depends on your your state, your city. I mean, there's some places that um, you know, I, and this all goes back to being commercial and industrial because I don't know about. The residential se sector. I mean, I would say if you're a residential person and you want to do repairs, then I would go to the place with the oldest homes and go from there. Now, let's go. Next one. I really, I don't know why. It's so hot in Texas. It's like sucking the life out of me. It's so hot here. I got the air conditioner on too. I'm still hot. That's why I try not to even come upstairs. The office is upstairs. Second floor. I got the AC on like 76. I'm still just dying up here. All right. Uh, number seven. I only got 20 questions, but this is number seven. How can I establish relationships with suppliers and subcontractors for my construction projects? I mean, unless you're new to the industry, you should already have relationships with suppliers and subcontractors. If you are completely green, you have no idea what you're doing, I would suggest that you know, you rethink this whole idea of opening a business and go work for a general contract as a laborer or something like that and work up the ranks so you understand the in and outs. But you need to work the ranks like all the way from, you know, estimator, PM, SPM, site soup. I mean, you got to go through the ranks. Uh, owner's rep because there's so much that's involved. Um... And you need to be the smartest person. If it's your business, you need to be the smartest person because I've seen plenty of people open up businesses and they don't know their ass from the elbow. And what happens? They, they, their foreman tells them something and they believe it. You know? Where if you know what you're doing, then you, you know that even if your foreman uh, decides to get drunk and not show up for work, you can put your tools in your truck and you can get rocking and rolling and that's it. Uh, and believe me, you know, owning a business is that. It's babysitting. You know, on top of everything else, it's babysitting because, you know, the, the biggest variables we have in construction is our manpower. Manpower. Once you have your manpower, woman power, whatever you want to call it, the next hurdle is always going to be money. All right? But you can't get paid if you don't have workers that are doing the job. So I say that's number one. So, in regards to suppliers, suppliers, once again, um, you sure have relationships with them. If you're not, if no one knows you, then it's simple as just calling them up and asking them, uh, you know, I'm a new corporation, whatever, how can I, how could I uh, get a credit app? And once you get a credit application, we'll see what happens. Sometimes, if no one knows you, they're not going to even allow you to get a credit app. They might ask you to open up a COD account. Uh, so you would just give them your EIN and your corporation documents and you would have a COD meaning you pay for everything as you as you uh, purchase it. Uh, you know, right there, cash on demand, cash on delivery. Um, the thing is that you might have to do that for a year or so before they actually allow you to get a credit application. So, you know, it's pros and cons to everything, but if you do the 35% mobilization, you should be covered. Okay, number eight. <sighs> what are safety regulations and protocols should I be aware of when running a construction company? Well, rule of thumb should be OSHA, right? OSHA, OSHA, OSHA. If you get yourself a... Uh, you know, OSHA 30, OSHA, whatever it is. Uh, in New York City, you need site safety cards. 
that's going to depend on the area you're in because New York City is going to be very different than let's say Texas where in New York City we had to have site safety we had to have OSHA 30s we had to have uh, silica training and, and a lot of stuff you could hook yourself up with uh, different different uh, companies uh, I'll try to put one in the description that I use where they, they know your state so they give you your posters because you need to have safety posters they give you training they give you everything your, your, your toolbox talks so that you should leave up to the professionals in your state in terms of hire a safety company and you know you're only talking three four five hundred bucks at most um, and just let them give you everything you need so you're compliant right because that's all it's about it's about being compliant and as for safety protocols, as you know, go by the book. I mean, you can't go wrong if you go by the book. And if something doesn't look safe, then stop. Okay. Um, and that's it. I mean, you want to make sure you go home at the end of the day with both your eyes, your head, your fingers, your limbs. You know, cut up. You know, we all have families. We're here to make money and and just do our job, right? So, you know, just. Just err on the side of caution, you know. You know, are there things that you need to provide? Yes, they'll, you know, hopefully the safety company will tell you, but, uh, you know, just assume that you need to provide hard hats, gloves, safety glasses, air, ear protection, rest, uh, you know, face mask if need be, um, water on the job site, you know. And now there's other things that you should provide that aren't required, but you should because, you know, you. You know, if you're like me, you came from the trade as well. So, um, you know, have a table, have some chairs, have a microwave, have a coffee maker, have a water thing, have a refrigerator. Um, you know, the guys, all you guys and girls should be comfortable working for you, right? You have your first aid kits, your fire extinguishers. You know, people could put their lunch in a the refrigerator. They could warm it up, have a toaster oven because you'll get guys like me that don't want to use a microwave. We want a toaster oven. Um, you know, but people should be comfortable. They should know that they're going to work for somebody that cares for them. You're going to care. You're going to give them a better job because you know that you're getting paid and they're taking care of you, right? So have the waters, have the, the napkins, the utensils. It, it doesn't cost much, you know, it, and it's going to go a long way. How can I estimate, number nine, sorry, number nine, how can I estimate project cost? and create accurate bids for construction projects. Once again, guy, whoever you are, it depends on your trade, right? Because the software I use for electrical contracting might not be the best software for you if you're a plumber or HVAC or a painter or a sheetrock, you know? That really depends on that, on that trade. For electrical contractors, I personally like McCormick. McCormick was the best price and the best platform, you know, compared to Acubid, because Acubid's very expensive and it's not like it's doing anything special, right? But if you're also from the trade like I am, then we learned how to estimate longhand, meaning we have a scaling ruler and a notepad and we could do our measurements and do a take off and go from there. The computers came a long way. The estimating software came a long way. As I said, I personally like McCormick, but Acubid might be for you. You know, if you're going to be utilizing Procore and things like that, then it might be worth the extra money, but it's a lot of money. And you have to have a very, very, very good computer to run these programs if you want it to make sense. If you, you know, actually want to be able to do a takeoff and not wait two years for the drawings to load, right? Because it takes a lot of RAM. I mean, my, the computer I'm working on now has 128 RAM and it has like all these different cores and solid state drives and two terabytes of this and two terabytes of that and a 10 terabyte. I don't know. It works. I can tell you that it, the computer is super fast and it was a custom computer. So, you know, you need to keep that in mind because that could be another two, three thousand dollars. Um, you know, with your monitors, you know, because you need big screens. So I have big screens because you're looking at a construction site. You're looking at a whole building. You're looking at every plan, every detail. 
So, if you're not going to do longhand, you need to figure out what software is going to work best for you. You could call McCormick, you could call Acubit, and go from there. There's other companies and there's other takeoffs uh, software, but I, I don't know them, be, and that's probably one of the reasons is they probably suck. And, you know, don't waste your money on these things that are not going to work right. All right, number 10. What, is the what are the common challenges faced by construction companies, and how can I address them? Your biggest challenge is going to be, besides picking your name, because that is definitely challenging. Your biggest obstacle, your biggest challenge is going to be landing your first project. Landing your first project, um, you know, assuming that you have no, no connections, no, no, no nothing, right? You're, you're going out new and you're reaching, you're cold calling and you're getting drawings and you're putting bids on it. That's going to be your hardest thing. You know, the biggest challenge is going to float yourself and your family. So if you have a family like I do, you need to figure out the bills for the next, assume, eight months. Your mortgage, your, your, your car, your insurances, the business's insurances, uh, your cell phone bills, your company's cell phone bill. You got to you gotta have something in the piggy bank to float yourself. So that's going to be a big challenge. Is that my dog? Marcus, you all right? Hang out one second. Okay, yeah, that was my dog. He was having a bad dream. <laughs> it's so hot, even he's sleeping. He's just like, ah, I'm going to bed. Forget about it. It's too hot. So, if you can float yourself for eight months or whatever it is, then you, you know, you'll be in good shape. But you need to assume that you're not going to land your project, the first project, for a long time. So, that's, uh, that's the only way you can really address that. You know, besides getting something out the game. Okay, number 11. What are the current trends and advancements in construction technology and equipment? <sighs> Estimating software, Procore, uh, BMIC, Plan Grid, uh, AI, right? These things that we used to do ourselves, like writing letters and things like that, you could do on the computer now. So, you know, if you're an up and coming person and you're very uh, computer savvy, then then you got a lot going in your favor, right? Because there is a lot of cool technology out there. BIM, uh, you know, 3D renderings and things like that. So, but that is a loaded question because there's way too much to discuss uh, with the trends and advancements and things like that. I will say, however, that a computer cannot replace a tradesman in, in regards to know-how and know what they're looking at, when they're looking at it, and how long things are supposed to take and things like that. There's no crystal ball with that. You just need to know, okay? Call it street smarts, call it construction smarts, whatever, but you just need to know and there's, gonna be, there's no replacement for that. So. Number 12, how can I, uh, what are you writing? How can I, I guess he's trying to say, how can I efficiently manage and schedule construction projects to ensure timely complete, completion? Okay, um, once again, you need to know your numbers. If you did the estimate, estimate on the project, then you should know that job like the back of your hand better than anybody, right? If you're the one that did the estimate. And you should also know the time. So if I do an estimate, I know that I have 1,200 hours to do a project, and that's the estimate, and that's what I went to contract with. Then I, I'm already setting aside, you know, uh, let's say I, I'm going to turn to the field, I'm going to say, I want this job done in 800, 800 hours, right? Because you have to have a goal. You have to come in under, right? So once you have boots on the ground on the project, your first day, you're going to already have a look ahead. A look ahead is you're going to project on where you're going to be, what you're going to complete, or what you're going to start within those two weeks. 
Now that's one portion of the project schedule. The other project schedule, depending if you're the plumber, the general contractor, the electrician, you're going to take, if, you, if you're a subcontractor, you're going to take their schedule, their project schedule, and then you're going to look at it and you're going to say, no, that doesn't work. Uh, no, I cannot install PDUs at that point because the concrete guy's not going to be ready or the PDUs are two weeks out. I'm not even going to receive that material for two weeks. So you take theirs and you, you overlap your actual schedule and then, you know, you could negotiate, or, you know, but long lead item, long lead time items, um, there's just nothing, there's, you can't do anything. Um, but that needs to be stated in your contract too, is that you, you have no control over certain items. You know, if, if the client is specking a certain product, and that product is a year out and they want the job done in six weeks, kick rocks, buddy. You're going to have to find something else. You're going to have to figure out. And then that's when you could turn around and say, I'll find you an equivalent. And you could send the submittal and have them approve it or deny it. That would go in your transmittal log, same log as your RFIs. Um, and how do you effectively manage the schedule that you're making? Well, it comes down to having good leadership in the field. Whether it's a site super, a traveling superintendent, a good foreman, a good mechanic, a good whatever. You need to let them know that schedule. And you need to also never reveal your hours. So you would never tell your main guy that, hey, I got 1,200 hours for this job, but I want to do it in 800. You know, because what's going to happen is you're going to run up onto the 800 and they're going to be like, oh, well, we got 1,200. You know, you need it to be the opposite. When, they, when they're approaching 800, you have to say, like, guys, come on, bud, this was only supposed to be 800. All right? You get what I'm saying? Uh, but knowing that you have a buffer, and that's why I like to call it as a buffer, and then you take that, that money or, or those hours and you put it into a bucket. A bucket's what we like to call for different... Uh, buckets you'll have different amounts of money or different time so if I have a bucket here for PDUs and installation of it bam I have a bucket do I have light fixtures yeah here's the light fixture bucket do I have the labor for the light fixtures here's another bucket for that uh, equipment rentals here's a bucket for rentals my uh, bucket truck my scissor lifts and so on and so on um, so you need to always have a buffer in each one of those buckets and especially when it comes to the time, the, the labor hours on the job. Okay, number 13. What is the be best practices for managing a construction team and promoting productivity? If you do what I say in regards to making sure that they have table, chairs, you know, refrigerated, and paid on time, um, give them an attaboy every once in a while. Go, say, I like your work, you know. Don't be a hard ass. At the end of the day, it's people dealing with people. And we want we want our employees to know that, that we care because we do care, right? Because if they're not happy or, or they're, they're miserable, um, you're not going to get any uh, production out of them, right? At the same time, you don't want to be miserable, right? So you want to be happy. You want them to be happy. Unfortunately, when you have a big company like I did, you know, and you have... 40-something people working for you every single day. You have 40-something personalities you got to deal with, and you need to be able to pivot with each person, right? Some Somebody might be fighting with their wife. Somebody might just not be making enough money, or, you know, you just have a lot of different things. You, know, you have a, one guy drinks all night, another guy is partying. You know, one guy got, gets arrested. A guy ODs on your job site. Things happen. And those are all real stories. Uh, you know, I've had a guy OD on a job site. What are you going to do? And at least the, the, the contract I was working for has had similar experience. So, you know. Um, but that's, you know, you can only go so far. You know, but you try to make sure everybody's happy. Everybody has what they need. You know, everybody gets to take their breaks. You know, and, and don't be a hard ass in terms of Somebody wants to go out and have a cigarette, let them go have a cigarette, okay? You don't want to deal with the guy who wants to have a cigarette and you're not letting him. Just let him have a cigarette and go on, all right? Because you're going to say, oh, well, it's going to cost me 15 minutes.
it's going to cost you five hours, eight hours if, you, if you're going to be mean to the guy. Okay? We're, we're human. You know? I need a cup of coffee. Go get a cup of coffee. Hell, I'll buy it. Okay? You want to go? I'll go. Whatever. I'll buy the coffee. Because one, I want a cup of coffee. And two, I was a worker. I love working with coffee. I used to carry my coffee all day long. So, I'm not going to knock somebody who wants a cup of coffee. Right? So, number 14. How could I differentiate my construction company from competitors and attract clients? That is um, not the commercial industrial uh, way. I think that's more geared to residential. Um, but how could you differentiate yourself, your construction company? Well, you, you know, certifications, right? Uh, EPA Universal, uh, you know, or safety, uh, Bechtel passports, things like that. The more certifications you have, uh, the better, right? If you could say, oh, I do photovoltaic, I design, RCDD, and so on and so on, that's a good start, right? Let people see that you have a site safety plan, um, you know, and that your documents match, you have photos uh, of you and your, your, your guys and girls, whatever, family photos. People like to deal with people at the end of the day. It doesn't matter how big the company is. Yes, it, it does all boil down to numbers. We understand that. This all boils down to numbers. Um, you'll have certain situations where numbers don't play that big of a role, but they still do. Um, so if you're personable and people like you and they want to have a conversation with you or they just want to talk or whatever, whatever it is, if you're personable, then you're going to attract more customers. And maybe you don't want more customers. And that's another thing to consider. I'd rather have two, two clients or one client. I had one client float me for a year that I got so much work from one client. I didn't need another client. I still I was still looking for a client, but I didn't need one, right? Because this one client gave me so much work. Um, so that's another thing to consider. What's, what are you shooting for? What's your volume? Right, so because if your insurance policies are set for five hundred thousand, maybe you don't want to go over five hundred thousand. So, just be just be a good person. If you're a good person, good things happen. I know it sounds wacky, and believe me, sometimes I don't believe it either. You know, but the old saying is, you know, you know, it's always nice to be nice. Number 15, what are the potential risks and liabilities associated with running a construction business? Uh, you could go bankrupt. <laughs> like I did, I went bankrupt. Um, however, mine was due to COVID lockdowns in New York City. Um, potential risk, um, liability, right? Someone gets injured on your job site, you don't have the right insurances. Um, you know, th that's a real potential risk. Um, but that's why you, you need to make sure you have the right uh, insurances. Um, let's say you mess up a job, right? Or you can't complete a job. What's your liability? Well, if you're contracted to do a job and you can't finish it and they need to hire another contractor to finish your work, guess who's going to pay for it? Well, guess who they're going to try to make pay for it is you. Um, does that ever really pan out? No, it usually becomes a wash. People say you're going to lean, they put liens on the buildings, and it goes back and forth in litigation. And at the end of the day, nobody wins, right? In residential, you put a lien on somebody's property and you'll win eventually. But with commercial industrial, it's just back and forth. And it usually goes nowhere. And I could tell you from experience, um, it just it doesn't go anywhere. The only person that gets hurt at the end of the day is you and your workers. Um, you know, sometimes a general contractor, but most likely it's going to be you. And sometimes it's just not anybody's fault, right? You know, uh, when I was uh, on Just Electric NYC, I mean, we had COVID. And they shut down the whole New York City. All the private uh, projects were shut down. Stop work or the DOB. New York City DOB shut them down, so... And you had a lot of clients that went bankrupt or they didn't want to continue in New York City. It was riots and things like that. So, food for thought. 
that's why it's very important to, to make sure you pay yourself. Always pay yourself. You need to pay yourself first. Okay. Let's see. Number 16. How can I ensure compliance with environmental regulations in construction projects? That's something depending on your trade. If you're a subcontractor, you really don't need to, to worry about that unless you come across something hazardous, like let's say PCB ballast, right? Um, you know, where it's a hazardous thing and you need to dispose of it properly. Um, that's something that if you were writing a contract, a contract I would say excluded, have the general contractor deal with it. Um, if you're a general contractor and you have to deal with it, you need to figure out what dump and what are the regulations regarding it. So if it's asbestos, you need to figure out uh, who to license asbestos testers first, right? Because you have to have paperwork saying that whatever it is that you're touching is actually ACM, considered hot. And then you would have a separate company that would do the abatement and then take it to uh, a dump that's dedicated for hazardous waste. So the best way to stay compliant is if you don't know is to call the authority having jurisdiction. So if you're ripping up a vinyl floor, it might have asbestos uh, glue. Um, once again, this is all something that you would learn as you're in the trades. You know, like there's a lot of wire that is asbestos. And unfortunately, a lot of people in our trades are not smart enough or were never taught, but you need to make sure that you're smart. You need to be the smallest person. Um, wire had asbestos in it, a lot of it. So if it's hot, then you can't, as an electrician, you can't take it out. The only thing you can do is make sure that there's no power to it because when they come to abate it, they're going to cut it all out and dispose of it. So you need to know what you're looking at sometimes. Number 16, how can I ensure... Oh, I did that one. Huh. 17, I only got 20, right? Okay, what are the prevailing wage rates and labor laws that apply to construction companies? Okay, if you're doing city, state, or government projects, and you will have some clients that aren't any of those, but they still want you to pay the wage. Um, <clears throat> so it says, how to uh, labor laws that apply to construction companies. Okay, so if you have a prevailing wage job, you need to figure out the rate for it, right? So in New York City, you'll have uh, the rate and you'll have your fringe benefits. And if you are, um, if you do offer benefits, then that is deducted from that. So let's say uh, it was $50 a fringe benefit and then it ends up, it cost you like 50 bucks for benefits and the, the worker would only get the, the prevailing wage, but if their base pay is higher than the prevailing wage, then they go with their base pay, right? And then you have to do certified payroll. The best bet is to figure out what it is, whether it's city, state, or government, and then you have to look at their rates. So if it's federal government, it's Davis Beacon, and, uh, or Bacon, Davis Bacon, <laughs> Bacon. Um, and then you'll see what your trade is, what your classification is, what hours you're doing, and then you'll figure out, it'll tell you exactly like, okay, electrician doing signs are going to be paid this and then your fringe benefit. Um, so that's easy enough to figure out. And on top of that, if you're using ADP or Paychex, you would just tell them what it is uh, and they would keep you compliant with giving you certified payroll which you would then have to submit to your client or state or city agency, or you would just have to hold it for record. Okay, number 18. How can I create a marketing and advertising strategy to pr promote my construction services? Once again, I don't do residential, so this really doesn't apply to commercial industrial sector unless you want name brand recognition. If you want name brand recognition and you want people to know who you are, I would get onto websites like the Blue Book, um, Plans and Bids, I own that one. Um, you know, just try to get into as many directories as you can. I would try to avoid Google um, because that's not going to help you with name brand recognition. And, and if you have an argument with somebody on Facebook, let's say, and they know you own a company, they'll write you a bad review. It's happened to me. You know, I didn't do work for these people and 
they had an argument that we had an argument and they were writing you bad reviews. So I would say avoid that. Plus it's not going to help you because your clients are not on Google looking for you. Okay. So if you just want name brand recognition, I would suggest, you know, you could do a Facebook advertisement, LinkedIn, and go from there. But commercial industrial sector, it's really not needed. Um, make sure your van or your trucks have graphics on if you want. You know, especially if you're in New York City, it's like driving a billboard. So, you know, my trucks have lettering all over it. Uh, and that would actually help. I would get a lot of calls from that. I actually took one of my trucks from back home and drove it in Texas for about four months. I never took the lettering off because it was too much of a pain in the neck. So I was driving around with Just Electric NYC in Texas and I was still getting phone calls. But now I was getting phone calls from people in Texas. So lettering on trucks really make a difference. Um, probably better than everything else. Um, all right. 19. What are key considerations for selecting the right construction software and tools? That depends. I think we already touched base on this. Is it really depends on on the industry you're in, and that's really you know when it comes down to it, and you're not experienced in it, you won't know the right tools. So I would try to speak to people that are, uh, and then see what they're using. But you could always do a Google search and figure it out too. Uh, you might find the software company that, that's looking to sell you uh, a solution, right? Like when I first was introduced to McCormick, um, it wasn't because I used it. I didn't use it first. I used to use Acubit when it switched to software versus longhand. And when I was speaking to a software person buying Acubit, they said they asked me if I tried McCormick. And I said no, and they set me up with McCormick to try it, and I loved it. So, the information's out there. Okay. All right, number 20, last question. Oh my God. How can I stay updated on industry trends and network with other professionals in the construction sector? Commercial industrial sector, your best networking platform is going to be LinkedIn. LinkedIn is, you know, going to be geared towards commercial industrial, right? Bigger projects. That's going to be your best bet to go and network. And then also trends. Uh, I have a website called plansandbids.com. I try to keep the industry updated on, on trends. Um, but LinkedIn's going to have it. Obviously, you have a lot more people on LinkedIn, and they're all, uh, you know, sharing stories and things like that. So, don't go to Facebook. If you're in the commercial industrial sector, there's nothing for you on Facebook with your company, right? Unless you're doing name brand recognition. LinkedIn's going to be where it's at for you. That's the best bet. Um, <clears throat> but something I wanted to touch base on before. Um, and I think it's just a very good uh, idea um, because a lot of people approach me or they send me an email or they write me a comment and they want to get into the tower industry, the construction industry, but they, they really don't know where they want to be. I am always going to say that you need to master a trade or if you don't want to master a trade and you don't know really what you have to do, is to go work for a general contract as a laborer. You really need to start from the beginning. And I know you might say, oh, it's going to take me years, it's going to take me this, that. Well, it doesn't have to. But at the same time, I'm not the one that's looking to open up a construction company and doesn't know what I'm doing. You need to sweep the floors. I mean, sweep the floors. you got to figure out who's who, what's what. Why are they doing that? Why are they putting metal up there? Why is the electrician doing this? What's fireproofing? You need to know the ins and outs. You need to understand how freight elevators work, right? Because if you're in New York City and you're doing a job and you have to deal with a freight elevator, you know that you have to tack on a certain amount of time because you know that you might have to wait an hour for that freight elevator. You know, what happens when you guys go to lunch? they got to leave at 11 and they're going to come back at 1 because it took them an hour? So these are things that you wouldn't know unless you know. 
right? So you need the experience. You need to work for somebody. When it comes to estimating, there's a lot of tips and tricks when estimating alone. Just like reading, okay? You need to read every single note. You need to read the spec book. You need to know it like the back of your hand because there's things in there that are looking to get over on you. And remember, no matter how nice everybody is, someone's looking to get over on somebody else. Somebody wants something for free. Someone's looking for a scapegoat. And that could be you if you don't know better. Someone's looking to, you know, bankrupt you or, or sue you or, or make you default on a bond. So, but you wouldn't know that if you don't have experience, right? So for the guys that are looking to get into this and the girls that are looking to get into this with zero experience, I would suggest you maybe, maybe pump the brakes a little bit and go backwards and try to figure out what it is that you want to do. Because if you open up a general contracting company and you don't know what you're doing, who are you going to hire? How are you going to hire someone? Because you don't know what you're doing. So you don't know what questions to ask. Now, have there been successful people that, that don't know anything get, come into the industry? Yeah, there has been. But, you know, I would say out of a percentage of those people, 99% of them had mommy and daddy's money, right? When you have money, it's easy to do anything, right? Because, I, you know, you could be introduced to somebody that, that does know the industry and that you would hire them as an owner's rep. And what does the owner's rep do? They represent you. So they might know the industry and you don't. So they know the questions to ask people, and they run the show, in essence, and you're just the owner. Is that a good business move? It could be. It could be. Or it could be a terrible business move. But if you have money, then, and you, you know, you don't mind losing some of it, then that's one way to go. But also keep in mind, depending on the size of the business you want, the more expenses you have, the more your overhead is. So the more your overhead is, the less your profit's going to be. The idea is to operate at such a low overhead that everything is profit for the most part, right? So I was able to bring my, my overhead down to like 1500 bucks a month to operate. That's low, okay, for New York City, that's low. You know, that doesn't include payroll, obviously. We were spending about $72,000 per week on payroll. so. It depends on a lot of factors, right? Whether you're gonna make it or not. And whether you have the, the guts to go after what you want to. Now, if you're in the commercial industrial sector, you know, I was always told to don't get big too fast. And I used to laugh and be like, what are you talking about? Get too, get too big too fast. I'm trying to land one job. <clears throat> after eight months, I landed my first job as my own business, turned into my second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. All of a sudden, you have way too much work. You have way too much work, and, you, and your manpower is spread across five boroughs. And each one of those projects have needs. Where now you're hiring superintendents to drive around all day to all these different job sites. And pacifying people and, and babysitting. And then on top of that, you have more and more attitudes or needs or conversations I mean so don't get big too fast that is a, a real true story because uh, you know sometimes the numbers look great but the stress is just not worth it because you you don't have time to yourself and what happened to us where what happened to me is it came to a point where I was too stressed out all the time and I couldn't shut off it was not a day that I could just shut my phone off because there's always something that's gonna happen it would be difficult to schedule something or go someplace with my kids because I knew I needed to be readily available and every time I tried to do something or go someplace with my kids something would happen it was like clockwork and that's a terrible way to live. It causes a lot of stress. So I don't want you to get too big, too fast. You know, build a team, get good people, get good PMs, 
If you have a good PM, you don't need an owner's rep. A good PM will run the, run the show. Make sure you take care of your PMs. Your project managers are important. I'm a PM as a consultant, so I'm going to tell you that. Your PMs are going to make sure you're profitable. They're going to make sure you're getting paid. They're going to make sure the supervisor knows what he's telling the staff. Good PMs. If you're not doing estimators, good estimators, and you'll be fine. But just don't bite off more than you can chew. You know, it sounds crazy until it happens. And you're, you're going to say, oh, you know what? Justin DeFilippo is right. Got big too fast. Now I don't know what to do. And I'm going to say, just call me up. I'll help you out. Hey, thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the comments. Uh, like, subscribe, share. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. We'll figure this out. But, uh. Anything you guys need, I'm here for you. Good luck.